Good afternoon. Welcome to this lunch meeting. Good uh, to see you here. I'm uh, Harm Veling. I will uh, give a lunch seminar on pre-registration. Um, just uh, to start out with, so who of you has pre-registered the study before? Only a couple of people. So that's, I think, uh, uh, maybe a good reason for me to give this lecture to, for you to evaluate whether this is something that can also contribute to uh, your work. Um, yeah, so I have, uh, I'm a psychologist by training. So and in psychology, there is a whole, I would say, pre-registration revolution going on. Uh, and uh, well, I will talk a little bit about that. I also have tried to make it more general uh, applicable and also in a general sense informative, but I do use some uh, arguments and maybe some examples from psychology. So I'm also interested to hear from you what you think is relevant for your work or, or not so relevant maybe. So um, now what's interesting I think about uh, pre-registration, I will start out with the background, is that pre-registration can be conceptualized as a, uh, an answer to a problem. And the problem is the following problem, and that is that uh, researchers often have to make many, many decisions when they do research. And so, of course, it's maybe start out with uh, uh, research questions, but also how much data to collect, <coughs> what are your outcome variables, decide between confirmatory and exploratory uh, parts of research, maybe inclusion and inclusion criteria for the data, maybe what kind of data transformation you use, maybe even the software that you use to analyze the data, uh, and which analysis to conduct. Now, and all these uh, uh, things are, are maybe not always established. They are not always standard operating procedures that, that really give you information on how to do this best. So usually there's a lot of flexibility in making these kinds of decisions. And what one of the problems is, is that um, these decisions can have a great impact on the conclusions and the findings that you observe from the data. So these decisions are not trivial. And there are multiple ways to make this visible. Uh, so here's a nice paper in Nature from 2020. And what they did is they had this huge data set about fMRI findings, so uh, brain imaging data. And they asked 70 research teams across the world to analyze the data. So they got a research question and they also got seven hypotheses to test. And they were just asked to, to answer the research question and test these hypotheses. What's very interesting about this is that they then asked uh, also the term to report how did they do this, so what kind of uh, analysis did they do. And what they found is that uh, no two teams used the same exact way of analyzing the data. And also that there was quite some disagreement on which hypotheses were confirmed and which were not. I think out of the seven hypotheses, there was consensus on one. And of the of five of the hypotheses, I think 40% of the team said yes, confirmed, and the other ones did not say that. And so flexibility in analyzing the data can be very consequential. It can be determined whether you accept an hypothesis or whether you think something is true or not. So that's very important. Now, this is a very complicated data set, fMRI data, thousands of voxels per participant. But even if you have very simple data, there's also a huge impact of flexibility on uh, the conclusions that you can draw. So this is a very well-known study from psychology. It's uh, from 2011. But I, I noticed that, that even today, it's, it's the most read paper from psychological science in the last six months. So it's very, very... Uh, prominent in the literature. Uh, what they do here is they show actually that flexibility can have a huge impact on, again, the conclusions that you can draw from data. So they have this silly experiment here where they have people listen to music and then they test whether listening to certain music can influence your age, how old you are. Well, of course, that's not possible. Eh? So the music you listen to doesn't appreciate. But they show that you can actually find an effect of this manipulation, listening to music on your age, depending on how you treat the data. If you put some flexibility in the data analysis, then there's a very high likelihood that you can find this effect, for instance, by adding a covariate to the statistical analysis, by making certain exclusions or inclusions of the data, 
or by uh, dropping or adding some uh, uh, conditions. Now, uh, so there's, there's problems with flexibility in the, in, in the sense that they can impact the conclusions that you can draw from your data. And uh, now there's different problems with this flexibility. So first of all, researchers may underestimate the impact of this flexibility on their findings. So they may not always realize how important it is, how you make these kinds of decisions in terms of the outcome that you observe. And this is visible from different things, right? So the, the paper I just showed you from 2020 was published in Nature. So apparently people find it very astonishing that if, if 70 research teams come up with a different result by analyzing the data, that, oh, wow. And so apparently we don't expect that necessarily to be the case. Um, and also the paper I just showed you is still one of the most read papers in psychology. So people find that amazing. Oh, apparently the decisions I make have a huge impact on the conclusions that I draw. Now, of course you could say, well, okay, flexibility, but it may give some kind of random noise blanket across all the findings. Well, if that would be the case, then it would also be not so nice, but not really problematic, but probably those decisions are made in a certain way uh, consistent with people's maybe expectations that they have already about the world. And so these decisions are not made randomly. And so the flexibility is not random, it's usually funneled towards certain expectations. And I'm a psychologist, uh, so uh, I know something about biases. So there we, we know that uh, people are not computers. Uh, so they, they uh, have uh, a memory that is not perfect and they have reasoning that is motivated sometimes at the goals that they have. And there's of course uh, really well established biases that people have. For instance, a uh, well known bias is the hindsight bias. And this is the bias that when you observe the result of something, that you think that you knew that all along. It's a very well known established finding. And of course this can be very problematic if you analyze your data and you, out you view an outcome of the data analysis and then you think, ah oh, yeah, yeah, but I knew that it would happen. That was my prediction, right? That is the hindsight bias. Then we also have a confirmation bias that we may sometimes look for information that confirms our expectations. If you think, oh, this must be true, then you may analyze the data in a certain way. You think, oh, maybe I should get rid of this, or maybe I should add a controlling variable in my analysis because this must be true. And of course, these two together are really toxic, right? If you start looking for results, and then when you see the result, you think, ah, I knew that that would happen. Then, of course, you get a huge bias in the results. And I will have an example that this can have a huge impact on the field. Now, then, of course, we know this. Huh? There's also a culture, usually, in, in science is competitive. And oftentimes, uh, positive results are rewarded, which gives an extra incentive, maybe, sometimes, to make certain decisions in a certain way to uh, make sure a certain outcome is observed, maybe a positive outcome. And another problem is that this flexibility is often not visible. And it's not visible to researchers themselves. So if I have a hindsight bias, so I look at the results of my analysis, I think, ah, I knew that all along. How do I know that? How do I know it's not a hindsight bias, but that I really predicted those effects? And also for readers from papers, it can be very difficult to see if people say, a priori, this, we decided to exclude these and these and these data. Did they really think that? A priori or not? Does the researcher really know? Do I know? It can be very difficult. And I don't say people intentionally do this wrong, but it can be unconsciously it can go wrong. And then you cannot evaluate the credibility anymore of the results, because you do not know is there some confirmation bias in there, some hindsight bias in there, did they make all the decisions really well? And so this may result in biases and questionable research practices. And questionable research practices means that you try to look for a certain result by adding or removing certain variables from your statistical analysis, for example, in order to observe certain result. Okay. Now, what is pre-registration? Oh, yeah. Well, just before I go to pre-registration. So one of the problems in psychological science, but also in some other domains, is that Results are not always replicated. And of course, that can have many, many causes. Uh, but one of the causes uh, that has been associated with this is this kind of flexibility that is not always transparent. So when people try to replicate something, then they often do not find the effect. So here the raw dots, the red dots, 
of filter applications. And in psychology, uh, no, in this study, they found that most studies could not be replicated. So where they found the significant results in the literature, they could not find it again in a new result. And there can be different reasons, but one of the reasons could be that in original literature, people used kind of flexibility to come to a certain result. And that increases the false positive rate. And therefore, it's very difficult to replicate those results later. Now, how do we solve that problem? Well, it's not completely solved, perhaps, by like pre-registration, but it contributes to a solution, is that what we say is, OK, let's make these decisions before we do everything that we observe about the data. Yeah, so pre-registration often, I will talk about secondary data analysis later, but usually you do it with a new data set or new research, that you make all these decisions a priori before you look at the data. Then, yeah, so data collection, all these things, then you freeze it. You say, okay, this is fixed, and you can do that online. So this is a psychological way to do it, but there's, for every field there's different ways or different resources where you can, can do this, so you can put all these decisions somewhere and explain how you would solve them. And then you timestamp them, and you can put an embargo on it, meaning that you can decide after how much time this pre-registration becomes public. If you're a little bit worried that your ideas might, you know, be catched by some other people because you're brilliant, then uh, you can put an embargo on it. In psychology, you cannot have an embargo forever. So after a certain amount of time, I think six years is the maximum, it will become public. Now, how does this solve the problems I was just talking about? Um, now, first, by doing this pre-registration, you get a very visible distinction between planned and unplanned parts of the research. Uh, you know exactly what were the decisions that were made before doing the data analysis and everything. And then, of course, you may still deviate from this later, because you might have good reasons when you observe the data that you think, wow, oh, this was really uh, uh, a bad decision. But then it becomes visible. Where is that decision being made? For yourself, but also for readers of your work. They can say, ah, oh yeah, you updated your decision making. And then they can evaluate whether they think that is a good or not so good reason. And by doing that, you can increase the ability to judge the credibility of findings. So if you can make all your decisions a priori, then have your analysis and then test it on a new data set, and you do not have to adjust anything. All your decisions were correct, and you find it a thing that you expect, then you can have really a lot of confidence that your ideas were correct, because you didn't have any biases into the stream. So you have control over that. Whereas if you have to adjust a lot of things during the data analysis, you think, oh, 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 wait a minute, this was a bad decision, and I have to change this and this and this, there's more and more probability that there is a bias going into the data analysis so that the result that you observe is less credible. Now, so it, may, uh, also the, so it makes it visible where you make certain decisions in the, in the workflow. It also decreases unintentional biases because uh, well, you, you know what you know before, so hindsight bias is eliminated because you have a time-stamped document what you thought before you did it. So you can evaluate whether you actually align with that. I pre-register a lot, and I must say that even for my main line of research, I sometimes had the weird experience that I looked at data that, ah, the hypothesis was confirmed, and I looked at the pre-registration, and it was not. And it was because, in the meantime, we did a couple of other experiments that gave certain results. And then, by the end of the uh, time, I really knew how it worked, but I didn't know that in the first experiment yet. So that can be messed up. And so you get less biases. And, of course, it may, yeah, perhaps it may also reduce temptation to use questionable research practices intentionally, so I'm a self-control, self-control uh, uh, researcher. So I'm from that literature. We know that people find it very difficult to resist temptations in the moment. So if you want to control temptations, you must ensure that you are not tempted in the moment. And pre-registration could help with this because if you timestamp everything, and later on you, you observe data, and you think, ah, oh, if I would add that covariate, then it works perfectly. Why not do that? And you can still do that. But uh, it becomes visible, and you cannot fool yourself anymore. And you can also not intentionally do that to present your data prettier than, uh, than you would otherwise have. 
Now, it also increases awareness of the importance of the source of flexibility. I think in psychology, many people were not aware that many of these decisions really impact your conclusions and results. Pre-registration also increases transparency. And so by outlining all these decisions, you make very clear to yourself and others, so what is the level of detail that I use in my work and my research before I start analyzing the data? And I will give a couple of examples later, but you can have really kind of broad ideas, like a verbal hypothesis. I think this will be larger than this. Or you can have very detailed expectations stating, for instance, I think that this is larger than this, uh, as tested with this and this analysis uh, under this and this condition. And um, this may also differ between fields and also may differ within your field. So for instance, I don't know, I don't know how people, you know, what exactly they think before they do a study at uh, Oxford psychology compared to Harvard psychology, compared to Hamburg psychology, compared to Rothbard psychology. I have no idea because we do not communicate this. So there could be different standards. And by doing these pre-registrations, you make them visible. And so what's now when, how detailed is the workflow? Also interesting, how many attempts did you do? If you pre-register all your studies, as I do, then at one point people can look at all my pre-registrations and then say, oh, you did a lot of attempts at this one, and then finally find something. But then it's maybe a uh, false positive if you try something 20 times and you find it once. Also for yourself, it's good to, to keep that in mind. Now, and also important, yeah, if you are well trained, you know that you have to make all these decisions about your data anyway. So sometimes people say, oh, it's such a lot of work to make all these decisions before I do the data analysis. That's sometimes a criticism that you can read in the literature. But um, yeah, you need to make all those decisions anyway. Only the the timing differs. So now you do them before you do the study, and sometimes people do them during the study, but you have to decide anyway. So you might as well do it before. Now, there's some indication that indeed eh, pre-registration is related to increased replicability of findings, reduced publication bias, and increased detection of bias. I do think that there's still a lot of research should be done. There's not a really good randomized controlled trial that that uh, examines pre-registered research compared to non-pre-registered research, that would be good, right? And to see whether in 20 years pre-registered research is more robust than non-pre-registered research. So these are more kind of correlational findings, but I think that is already an indication. Now, I, I didn't want to give too much juicy examples from psychology because I think that may distract a little bit because then people think, oh, this is really for psychologists and not for other kind of research area, so it's always a bit uh, um, yeah, difficult to do that, but still I thought I'd just give one example of the importance of pre-registration from the psychological literature. So in psychology, there has been this idea for a long time that uh, willpower can be depleted, that self-control can be depleted. So this means that uh, this is this kind of idea that, that, that willpower is a limited resource that you can deplete when you use it. For instance, if you need to control your emotions, then the resource goes down until it's depleted. And as a consequence, you cannot control your behavior afterwards. So if you come in a new context and your willpower is depleted, you cannot control yourself anymore. So in this new context, then there's the higher likelihood of, for instance, uh, being uncontrolled, so getting angry, or not being able to resist temptations, or, uh, or whatnot. Now, there's like hundreds of studies showing this effect, that you have one task in which you control yourself, and then you do not see an effect. Or, and then you see that people underperform later on, a, on the next task. Now, at one point, people started to look at this literature and thought, hmm, first, theoretically, this is quite implausible. They looked at the theories, and they thought, hmm, these theories are not so strong. It's actually, they are incorrect. At one point they had theories that, that the resource was glucose. So then they thought, oh, maybe this is, this is you know, glucose is depleting. But then they looked at the literature and, they, and, they, and they, you have these experiments where people need to control their emotions for 10 minutes. And then biologists said, well, this is not possible. It's not possible that if you control your emotions for 10 minutes then your glucose level goes down. That is just 
theoretically very implausible. And then other people started to look at the literature and they said, hmm, this is, this is, this is strange. And many underpowered studies, maybe all, all different kinds of studies. They, all, they use different tasks, different methodologies, different statistics, all a little bit different. And then uh, people started to use pre-registration to replicate these effects. So there's a couple of this is just one of them, but there's multiple of these pre-registered efforts to, to see whether you can actually find this effect also in a confirmatory predictive fashion. And they tend to fail. They cannot find it, this effect. And so this really raises questions, right, about does it exist in the first place? How is it possible? And I, for me, this is a very compelling argument for pre-registration. So that if you do not use pre-registration, there is the, the possibility that people in a research field are convinced about a certain effect. It must be there. And then not intentionally, but unintentionally, unconsciously start to analyze data in such a manner that they always find this result. And then when people start to pre-register and a priori make all these decisions fixed, they cannot find it anymore. Then for me, the credibility of that effect really is lowered. I'm not so convinced anymore about this effect. I, I don't really believe about it. I, I really believe in the findings that you can predict. Yes? As a small side note, does this also apply to children? Because this is the perfect example of why children misbehave after a day of school or a daycare. So for children, I think it might exist. But for yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you could talk about this effect for a long time. I don't say it doesn't exist. But the only thing I say is if you want to do an experiment and you want to show this effect, people fail. So yeah, that's difficult. Eh? And then also very interesting in this paper. So here are also some of the authors of the original uh, 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 proponents of this idea. They were actually the, the lead authors. Therefore, this is quite an interesting paper because these people said, it really works, it really works. I will show you that it works. We do a pre-register study. I will show you. Oh, they couldn't. But they do some exploratory analysis and, and then they do find some indication for the effect. But that's the whole point, right? So indeed, if you start to explore the data, then yes, you can find some evidence for this effect. But you cannot predict it when you fix your decisions. Yeah, I could give more examples like this, but it's also my experience in my own research, that sometimes you start a research project, you make some really good predictions, and you think this makes great sense, and you do not find it. Think, okay, I, I, apparently I don't understand the world as good as I think yet, because, you know, it doesn't work, and you do it again, and you do it again. And it's so immensely rewarding, at one time you really predict it, now, say, now I understand it. Now I do this, and exactly that happens. That's so great. So therefore, I'm really, I'm really into pre registration because it's just so makes me happy when you really know that that is, you know, working. Also, very interesting. Sometimes you do a pre registration that you think, oh, this will really, really work, and then it doesn't, and it's also great. So, for instance, we had these studies about. Uh, yeah, whether people are distracted by their smartphones doing a task. So we give people uh, some cognitive task, and then uh, there's the literature suggesting that if you have your smartphone nearby that you may di get distracted, so the performance goes down, and maybe especially when it gets notifications, right? So bleep, bleep, bleep. So we did this pre-register study where people did this cognitive task, and the thing was bleeping all the time. Nothing. Oh, that's interesting, right? So then we think, okay, maybe the other studies that found it previously, well, maybe they were, I don't know, made some decisions, so that it's a false positive. Maybe uh, these studies were older, and nowadays people are much more used to, to notifications, could also be the case, right? So it could also be the case that, that people changed over time, it's not necessarily that these people did something different. But it really gives me credibility when I look at these data, and I think, okay, well, we really cannot find this, and it's not biased by anything, it's just we try to do everything as good as we could, and we cannot find evidence for this. But if you do everything as good as you can, and you do find evidence, then you feel really confident. Then you think, ah, now I understand that. Yeah, so this was part one, the background. Is that all clear to you? Yes? I was wondering, does it sometimes also work iteratively, this pre-registration, where you first register how you will collect the data? and then update it again, maybe how you will analyze it, or sometimes research is, is stepwise, so you need to maybe add, or you need to wait for certain aspects to come in, mm -hmm. to, to even think about what the next steps are. Yeah, 
Does that happen or is it always at one point and that's it? Yeah, so that, that is of course a good question and it depends on the situation. I would say that the more informed you are about the data and what might happen, the, uh, the more difficult it is not to get biased down that stream, right? So indeed, if you update something, but you are really quite knowledgeable about this, then you, you run the risk of having some unconscious biases to get in there, right? So that is, I think, the challenge. So I don't think you can say it's not a good idea. I think it's always a good idea because you need to think really clearly about, okay, where's the flexibility? What are the decisions that I need to make? So you can definitely do that. But it is kind of, you get a higher probability that maybe some bias is getting in there somewhere uh, in the case that your update of the pre-registration is somehow informed by the data, right? So if it's, if it's new collection of data every time, then that might work. But if somehow you need to go back to something or you are a little bit informed about the data already and then do pre-registration, then of course you can get some bias into the stream. I do have some uh, comments also on this during the implementation part of this talk. Other questions until now? Or is, it, is this clear to you? No? Okay. Now, in the implementation phase of this, there's indeed a lot of questions. And um, I just want to address them. It's a bit, uh, yeah, a collection of things that I have experienced. So I, I've done pre-registration for, for seven years or so, and sometimes people ask for advice, and then I, I say that. So it's just a random collection of things that people sometimes struggle with. I also see in the literature, this is maybe less organized than the than the previous part, but I do think they, they may give some kind of handles on how to deal with certain things if you want to pre-register your work. Now, uh, so this is in the psychology, the kind of decisions that people pre-register. Um, but what's still difficult, if you start to do that, is um, that there are not conventions about exactly the level of detail that you need to use to pre-register. And there's even uh, sometimes you have some uh, platforms where you just can have an open-ended pre-registration, which means you can pre-register a Word document where you just you know, decide for yourself what you want to pre-register, which is great. But um, I also encountered as a reviewer uh, a lot of papers that said, we pre-registered our study, and then I click the link, and then I, and I see in the pre-registration that people say, we're going to examine risk. And that is, of course, besides the point, because that's not really helpful. I'm not sure why people do that. Maybe some institutions have mandatory pre-registration and people are resistant, right? They say, oh, I'll pre-register and then just put that on. Or they don't understand why they are doing it. Or maybe they think it looks good. I'm not sure what, what, what exactly the reason is why people do that, but that, that sometimes happens. But that's important, right? So pre-register, pre I, I, I pre-register, or this is a pre-registered study, is a meaningless uh, Label. That depends on what do you pre-register. How good is it? What is the quality? Now, and then, uh, so there are some 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 conventions are emerging slowly in uh, behavioral science. For instance, this is paper in Nature Human Behavior. You can also click this link and you come into some kind of dynamic uh, interface in which you can increase the transparency of your work and may also give some handles on the level of detail that you want to pre-register your work on. Also, for instance, in the area I work in psychological science, there was an editorial by the editor that said, well, we, we gave pre-registered badges for almost anything, but we're not going to do that anymore. Now, from now on, your pre-registrations have to be good. This also eh, 2022, so it's a really recent development. Now, but of course, you know, if you pre-register, you can think about that, and I was, yeah. All these decisions you can talk about for a long time, I'm not going to do that, so I'll just give an example about uh, the logic behind it. So for instance, uh, oh yeah, and the, and the heuristics that you can use. Uh, so of course there's a trade-off. So the more detailed you pre-register, the less bias there might be in there, and the most transparency you get. Uh, so detailed is in essence better. But of course, if you have more, if you have really lengthy pre-registrations, like like for pages, then there's of course a higher probability of getting errors in there. Really silly errors. I don't mean you know biases, but just typos or things that you 
the run. And uh, sometimes people are concerned with what reviewers should do with the pre-registration. Right? So imagine that you have a pre-registration that is 10 pages long, and then you see the paper. What is the reviewer supposed to do, right? To so uh, compare the two documents completely, so that's very difficult. So sometimes people also say, well, it's better to have a shorter pre-registration so that it's easier to evaluate this. Depends also a little bit on how you think about pre-registration. Do you, do you do it for yourself to make your work better? Then it doesn't really matter that it's really long because it's just to make your work better. Or do you do it for other people to evaluate whether you do that exactly, and then shorter might be better, right? So that is also something that's not even agreed upon. Now, okay, so let's say you have a statistical analysis as in your pre-registration. That's what you should do, right? Then if you look at this kind of recommendation, they say, okay, pre-registration fully describes the intended statistical analysis for each research question. This may be require, for example, information about the sizeness of tests, inference criteria, corrections for multiple testing, model selecting criteria, prior distributions, etc. Right? Uh, so the better you do that, I agree, it's, it's better, but it can be quite difficult sometimes as a researcher to understand what are exactly the things that I need to write down then, right? And as a heuristic, I would always think about, okay, what is in your area the, the thing that people need to make decisions on usually? So what are, so if the, for instance, the alpha level is always 0.05 in a certain research area, and that's never being decided upon, yeah, then I think it doesn't make sense to have all these decisions in there about things that, that everybody does as a convention. Right? So usually you want to pre-register things that you may deviate from a convention. If you say, I have an alpha level of 0.1, it's more lenient, that's perfectly fine, but then it's of course good to pre-register that because you're more being more lenient, for instance. Right? And also what we do a lot is pre-register more formal information. So we usually pre-register our statistical syntax from R instead of explaining everything, right? Because then it's very clear we have this research question, this hypothesis, we pre-register this statistical syntax to test that hypothesis. And in that syntax it says many of these things, right? I think that's very helpful. But still, there's always difficulties. So, um, should you pre-register why you made a certain decision? Now, people may agree or not agree on this. So, so, so I think it might sometimes be good to, to explain why you made a certain decision. For instance, if you say, well, I, I want to correct for multiple testing by doing this and this procedure. For instance, a turkey correction or phonophony correction. Um, well, Somebody asked me this week, and they said, wow, I did the pre-registration, and I this and this correction, but I have no idea why. And I, and I now think it's not a good idea, because I think this correction is much better. Then I always say, well, it's at least good that you pre-register, right? Because now you're aware of this, that you did something first and then later. And if you do not understand quite well anymore why you did it in the first place, it doesn't really matter. You have to substantiate why you think the, the other one is better. And then the readers of your work can evaluate whether they think your results are still credible. That's it. A pre-registration is not a prison. Yeah? That's what sometimes people say. Sometimes some people are worried that this pre-registration, that you need to adhere to everything and that you cannot deviate from it or that only what you pre-registered is good and the rest is bad. That's not the case. It makes transparent and clear what, what are the decisions that you made throughout the process. Yeah? All right. Now, sometimes, and this may be also uh, uh, connect to your question about uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to make very precise predictions. So sometimes you can also pre-register how you approach something. For instance, you can say something like, uh, uh, well, if I... Uh, obtain a certain problem with the data, then I will follow the recommendations of field, this book. Right? That's already limiting your degrees of freedom quite a lot compared to just dealing with it, whatever seems best in the moment that you do it. So you can also pre-register data handling or decision trees or standard operating procedures if you find it very difficult to a priori say exactly and very precisely which exact syntax you will use because the data might be very noisy and you need some procedures before you go towards the data analysis. But that already limits your degrees of freedom quite a lot. 
and therefore it increases the evidential value that you see from your data. Now, deviations, eh? so can you deviate from a pre-registration? I'm very liberal in that. I say, yeah, it's always good to deviate. There's no problem at all. Uh, but it, eh? So uh, I would say you, you cannot change your pre-registration. It's timestamp. But you can always add a new one. You can say, well, we pre-registered this, and then, oh, later we thought this, so we pre-registered again. That's fine. Of course, it's better to do this when you're not informed about the data yet, right? It doesn't make any sense to have a pre-registration, then look at the data, and then say, based on the data, I now pre-register this. That seems obvious, but, uh, but that's, of course, not helpful. So what you can also do is, uh, in that case, report deviations in the manuscript. You can say, we pre-registered this, but uh, since then, we learned a lot. We read papers, we went to conferences, we talked to people. Now we think, well, oh, this was not a really good decision. Maybe this is a better decision. So we do it like that. Perfectly fine. And then it's up to other people to see whether they find that credible, whether they find that logical, whether they find that unbiased, because there can be very good reasons to deviate from your original thoughts. Yeah, and there's also a nice paper about that here. So open science is liberating and can foster creativity. And so you shouldn't feel as if what you pre-register is the only thing that you can do. No, you can deviate from that. This is an important point because reviewers don't always think like that. Sometimes they say, no, you should do it like that. There's also not always consensus on that. So if you counter that, then that is a nice paper too. To refer. Of course, the conclusions can become weaker. If you can predict everything really well, and you do not have to deviate in any way, you have more credibility in that you understand the world, and then you need to deviate to come back. Okay. Now, secondary data analysis. If you have a data set without prior knowledge, uh, pre-registration serves the same function as for new studies. But if you do know a little bit about it, you need to accept that you already have some biases. But pre-registration is still helpful because it can reduce further biases. Yeah, because there's still a lot of decisions to make. If you know something about the data already, then still it can be helpful to say, okay, but I want to answer this research question. I know a little bit about it, but still I'm going to make this and this and this and this and this decision to answer that research question. And then you have less bias compared to when you just start analyzing for a couple of days, and then you have a result and then think, oh, did I really think that in advance? How many degrees of freedom did I use? Is it really a credible result? And of course, pre-registration yeah, increases transparency of the workflow. What do you know in advance? And how do you update that belief? So if you want to read more on that, here's a paper on, uh, on that. So that you can read on secondary data analysis and all the difficulties with that in terms of pre-registration. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, just some general hints and tips. So sometimes you may explain in your text why you pre-registered. This is often not done. So people say just it was pre-registered. Uh, but there may be different reasons, right? For instance, if you do a secondary data analysis and you know really a little bit about the data, then you can say, well, uh, I knew a little bit about the data, so, uh, but I still pre-register because there's still a lot of decisions to be made and I want to have them a priori fixed so that it reduces the probability that I get further biased, for instance which is different from a complete new data set in which you want to maybe make a distinction between confirmatory hypothesis testing and more kind of exploratory data tests. Now, describe what you pre-register in the main text, eh, because I, as a reviewer, find it really yeah, annoying if people say pre-registered and then I look it up and uh, there's just, you know, not, yeah, it's just not clear from, the, from that what, what they did exactly, so maybe your data analysis or whatever you did. Now, if you deviate, yeah, I want to emphasize that, as you can see, because I repeat it all the time. Uh, you can also report that in the text, deviate from your pre-register. Now, there's also, if you looked at this uh, in psychology, I'm not sure whether it's also in other fields, it's not common to pre-register the theoretical rationale, because the purpose of the pre-registration is to reduce biases in the whole data analysis, confirmatory, kind of uh, bias, hindsight bias, that, those kinds of things. And for that, you may not need to pre-register the theoretical rationale. But there's still sometimes good reasons to do pre-register the theoretical rationale. And in essence, if you have a prediction 
based on a theory and you change the theory, then, then actually the prediction also changes even if the prediction leads to the same result, but that's more kind of a philosophical question. But there, there can be good reasons to also pre-register the theoretical rationale. Uh, also, maybe sometimes detailed methods. We also don't do that usually the, the, because we think that, that there's usually not the bias. The bias is usually not in the, in, in, in the description of the methods. But sometimes there can be good reasons to do that. Um, but, but there's also a way to do that if you really want that. That is called a registered report. I'm not sure whether it's on. That's also a talk in itself, so I'm not going to cover that whole topic. But here the idea is that you write your introduction and your method section, then send it out for review. <laughs> then reviewers comment on it. They say, well, this is good, this is not good. Then it's accepted, independent of the results of your study. Then you run the study, you observe the results, and then you write it. So I think this is also great. I think this makes great sense. I think many people have a paper rejected at one time in their career, and reviewers said, you should have done this, will agree that this is a better system. Right? You just give it to the reviewers before, then you can adjust stuff, then uh, you do that, and then uh, you publish it. And this is, of course, also a really good way to reduce publication bias. So in standard psychological reports, usually hypotheses are supported. And then if you do it like that, registered report, it drops to half. Also suggesting some kind of biases in the system if you do not do pre-register. Yes? Can I ask a question, Aaron? The, the, I know you're going to come to it now in a minute, but I think you're talking about open science framework now, effectively. Is that right? So this also includes data sharing at the end of a study as well, making your data publicly available as part of this as well, or commitment to do that. Can yeah. you make that clear in your, in your pre-registration as well? That you will uh, do open data or yeah. open materials. Um, yeah, I would say they, these are kind of independent uh, uh, things. So I, I would say open data and open materials are also very useful for other people to reproduce whatever you report. But they are unrelated to, to uh, reduce bias in your own thinking or, right? So usually, I, I don't think people pre-register that they will uh, share the data. data or share the materials, no. But indeed, on the Open Science Framework, that's the, the website, you can add your pre-registration, also your data, and also your materials. Right. So that's what, what most people I know in psychology use, because it's very convenient. You have just one link, you go there, there's data, materials, pre-registration, all at one spot. Yeah. So the wrong version of the paper can be publicly circulated for yeah. a long time. Yeah. The, how does that also sit then with the idea of that many of our pre registrations some of these trials will or won't be pre pre registered, but the preprint becomes the effectively becomes the outcome irrespective of peer review. Yeah. Yeah, so so I think that's also a talk in itself, right? About the benefits and the costs of, of uh, preprints. And for the reason you mentioned, I'm not a big fan of, of, of preprints because it's, you get this kind of versions yeah. uh, difficulties. But uh, my PG students, or my uh, the PG students that I supervised, uh, are really, really uh, pro preprints. Yeah. So, and we haven't resolved the discussion yet. So, yeah. Uh, so. Preprint is like a big registration to a certain extent. You're a publicly linked paper, you're a publicly linked position on this, these findings clear, independently of peer review and editorial. Yeah, but, but uh, it's quite different because it depends. So, in my view, a preprint is just a paper before you have published it, right? Yeah. Pre-registration is about making all kinds of decisions clear before you do the data analysis. So you can have a preprint where you <coughs> get the pre-registration in, right? But if you do, if you, you can have a preprint without any pre-registration, you just do your study, you do your analysis, you write it up. It's a preprint without a pre-registration. Hmm. Is that not clear? Yeah, for me, it's also you. Yeah. In that respect, you're, you're making that public. So in that respect, then, the parallels maybe with pre-registration there, I suppose. Yeah, in terms of the more kind of the, the, the theoretical content, I would say. The perception of it. Yeah. Sense, yeah. But I think the, the point of the pre-registration is really about the, this kind of the, the credibility of the findings. So, so the statistical analysis, how well do you know that this is not biased, that this is really what the data say? 
And that, that's a little bit independent of whether you publish that in a preprint or via peer review in the, in the normal stream. There's one last very short question, just in this graph on the bottom right. Is it common in psychological journals then also? And sometimes in the metabolic research, for example, we would submit the study design and outcomes to the journal editor and say, would you be interested in a paper like this? And if they say yes, then you know that you write, you write the paper within that style effectively. So it's, it, you, it's also always with pre-registered trials anyway, so the trial is pre-registered, but mm -hmm. you're effectively also pre-registering with a specific journal. So to your stage one peer review, you're effectively submitting the study design to peer review before so yeah, 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 and now uh, too, and you have, you do have this in some areas already. Yeah, yeah. in a, in a uh, certain uh, clinical trial context, you verify uh, the the protocol paper, and then have also the, the the data analysis in there, and you do it, and then you get that peer reviewed, and then do the trial, yeah. and then have a new another paper in which you report the results. Right. Yeah. So that that is basically this. The journal is basically the same, but we're interested in the outcomes of this, regardless, as long as it's done to this quality. I suppose. Exactly. Yeah, that, that is basically a registered report. But I think that was quite common maybe in medical research or clinical trials, and not so much in other areas where, the, where that makes big sense, of course. Yeah. yeah, one, so there's some criticism on, on pre registration. I, I, I think most of it is not so very convincing. Uh, I do want to point out one interesting view about some critique on pre registration is that maybe. Specific to psychology, I'm not sure. But, uh, but uh, some people say, well, uh, it distracts sometimes a little bit this, this focus on effects and statistical analysis and reducing false positives from the fact that, for instance, in psychology, sometimes you may have really weak theories. And if you have a really weak theory, then you can study all these effects really robustly. But yeah, what are you studying if the, if the theory in the first place is not very strong? So I find that uh, good to mention as a kind of reflection on, uh, on all of this. Okay, now, how is it going with pre-registration? I think there's some adoption going on. So this is Psychological Science, it's a flagship journal in psychology. You can see that open data is going up, open materials going up, but also pre-registered studies is going up in terms of percentages. So now 42% uh, of the papers in that journal are being pre-registered. As I said before, there's not really a quality check yet on that. So, But also interesting, in Horizon, so this is a slide in a slide, so Charlotte sent me this slide, so I put it in this slide. But uh, in Horizon, pre-registration is also mentioned as a recommended practice. I find that very interesting, right? So that even in the uh, European grand scheme, pre-registration is also more and more uh, acknowledged as being an important uh, quality uh, tool. Um, yeah, and you see it in more grand, uh, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, I think that, that that may be one of the reasons it's recommended and not mandatory, I think. Yeah, but there is also flexibility there. Is, is it required by the reviewers to check the information that's... Oh, you mean in a journal? Yeah, in a journal. Yeah, I think that uh, that is something that is not very explicit. So some, uh, in my experience, some people do it, some people don't do it. But we pre-register everything. And my, my impression is, is that, well, maybe in 30, 40 percent, people, uh, uh, you do not know, always know whether they really do it, right? Because then they may say, oh, it's really good that you pre-registered your study, but yeah, then of course I don't know whether they, they checked. But sometimes you have really, uh, I don't know, rigorous reviewers, and they're going to check everything, and then they, they make comments on that so that you can really know that they really did it. But it's difficult, I would say, to really know. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the most important uh, reason to do it is to get your own work more credible, that you get more confidence in your own findings, that you have this experience, okay, I can predict this and this will happen. More so than that you will do it for other people. or for. Of course, that is, yeah, 
but, but I do think it's helpful for me as a as a as a reader. So I would, you know, I, I'm, I'm much more confident when I read the paper. I check it, and I, and then, then I check the pre-registration, and then I see whether if they did exactly what they what they predicted, or exactly what they what they predicted they did in the paper. Then then for me, I have much more confidence in those findings compared to when I don't see a pre-registration at all. And sometimes you read these papers, I see them a lot, and then they say, oh, we have this covariate, we control for this, this, and this, without any pre-registration. How do I know at what stage exactly was this implemented? How do I know that I can replicate that effect? Is it not a false positive or not? I, cannot, I find it difficult to, to, uh, to evaluate. So I have much more confidence if people say, we're going to do this, and we find this, or even if they say, we're going to do this, well, we need to, to deviate, then I feel much more, uh, uh, yeah, reassured in that I understand what they exactly did and what is the credibility of those findings. Yeah. So I think that is really the reason, not for the yeah, other people. But it is, yeah, it's an interesting uh, discussion. It's a good point. And so this is where I have the badge. So I, I don't think you should pre-register to get the badge. That's not the reason. I think people do the badges to encourage people to, to try it out, but that's not the reason why you would do it. Yeah, so take home. Yeah, Pre-registration improves, I think, evaluation of the credibility of findings as, as for yourself on your own work, but also when you evaluate other people's work, you can better see the credibility because of these things that I explained already, so I'm not going to repeat that. And I uh, also want to emphasize that pre-registration should be liberating. I really have seen in the PC students I supervised, they pre-registered all their studies. We were much more, yeah, I'm not sure why, maybe our studies got better, but we have published all kinds of studies with null results suddenly, whereas in psychology it was really difficult and we did pre-registration and we didn't find anything and we published it much more easily with the pre-registration and maybe because the quality of our, our studies went up because we thought them better through, could be. Uh, but, uh, but that's really sometimes uh, yeah, gives kind of this liberating feeling, also what you mentioned. Huh? So, so if the study is good and the quality of the study is good, you should be able to publish it independent of the outcomes. Right? It is ridiculous that the outcomes determine the, the publication. And I think that is liberating. If you think like that, so, okay, it's not about the outcome. Also for PhD students, much, much less trust. It doesn't matter what the, what the outcome is. No, the study should be really, really good. I think that is the main point. And then it's also nice positive uh, experience. And in psychology, that was not the case. I'm not sure about other fields, but in psychology, it was really the case decades back that you really needed to have good data. Oh, I'm really happy that that is no longer the case. Yeah, so the question is, are, are, are psychologists forerunners? And how far is this also widespread in other domains? I think it's always interesting that I think psychology at one point did a bad job to such an extent that this became really, really visible, right? And then, because of that, uh, really updated that way of working to the extent that it's now quite rigorous, I would say. Or not, not all yet, but, well. And, well, so, so it depends also on how problematic it is in the field, perhaps. Uh, the, 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 but that's also why I think this slide, oh, sorry. Oh. The slide with the horizon is interesting because it suggests that it is no longer only in psychology a theme, right? So it's apparently in, in more areas important because it's a, a recommended pr a practice not for psychology, but within the horizon a grand scheme. And I do think that these kinds of ideas, so now in the Netherlands we have open science communities, and Wageningen was the last one, but we still have it. Also, uh, because uh, this is on the radar of many more people, of funders, of, of society, uh, the credibility of science. So we really want to uh, present things that, that work. And I think it's, it's, yeah, it's therefore on the, on the broader radar than psychology alone. But I, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not entirely sure what to answer to the question. Yeah. 
Yeah, people differ a bit in that. So I pre-register all experiments that I do. But what you also can do is, is first do a couple of experiments and then think, okay, now I understand it. And then do a pre-registration and then do a confirmatory test to, to, to show that you really understand it now. That's also a great way to do it. The problem is, is that in these first experiments there might be biases going in without you realizing it. And then you do your pre-registered study at the end and it doesn't work. And then you think, well, why not? So that is why I do every step. But yeah, that is also a matter of time, resources, uh, how you view that. I think so, yeah. But the other reason to do the course, the less obvious one is that if you go to any respectable journal now, they'll expect it for particularly for any kind of data you intend to publish, uh, and particularly in, on the analysis that or any journal or stats editor will always check your pre registered stats and uh, check that you're uh, adhered to that. any journal that are published in the day pre registration. Right, okay. Well, we're in different fields. <laughs> <laughs> I think, can I add to this? Because I think there are also very tip about this. I'm, I myself from a biological background, and very often these very small exper experiments you do in the lab are kind of repetitions of similar experiments, right? So you run another PCR, or you run another A. And in this case, it's often enough to just register, okay, this is a question I'm testing, and therefore I'm changing, changing this in this parameter. It should only cost you like five minutes because the rest of the protocol is, is already there. Um, so it's just for you to think about, okay, what am I testing today and what variable am I testing? And then writing that down, and that's kind of already helping in knowing that you're not fooling yourself. Yeah, you, you do often see indeed, right, that people do first pre-registration, and then if they do a little update, you do a second pre-registration, but only a couple of sentences that you say, well, see this pre-registration, and now I add this, and I add that, so that you can also keep track of it's that. Like Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It's almost time, I guess, right? Yes. We also have a follow-up question from, from teams uh, asking whether pre-registration is common at uh, Wageningen here. Maybe you don't know because you just started, or is it getting more and more common across the science groups here? Or do you have any insight on that? Well, of course, you know, I wasn't asked to give this lecture. I volunteered to give this lecture. I, because I think it's really important, right? So to, 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 to think about these things and to increase... Uh, the, the credibility of findings that we have also at Wageningen University. So, so yes, I would hope that it would spread, right? And that is also something that, that's also why I give this lecture. I hope to encourage you to do that and to also think about, okay, we, we want to do that. And in, uh, in our group, Consumption Healthy Lifestyles, people do that already. Uh, quite a, I'm not sure whether they all do it yet, but, but quite some. I'm not sure whether in your group people pre-register. Almost non-existence. Okay. But I've seen a chat that in development economics, for example, it's quite common and increasingly common also from the, the push side from the journals that they demand it from, uh, from studies yeah. to be pre-registered. Yeah. yeah, but that's also why I emphasize so much that you should do it for yourself, right? And not get these silly pre-registrations with, you know, resistance in there because I have to do it. Mm. Yeah, that's not, that's not uh, uh, sustainable. Then you get these short changes, but sustainable change we need. And for sustainable change, you need to internalize the importance and really accept it as a really good practice. Yeah, I'm a psychologist, eh? so you get that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your attention and, uh, and really good and nice questions. And I hope to have you uh, inspired you to, to spread this also a little bit uh, in your groups. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions... Uh, at one point or you want some help with pre-registration, please feel free to contact me. I'm also always available to help you out with any questions or about this. Okay, Thank thanks. You.